All right, welcome once again in our first story. Guinness Ghana Limited has pledged its support for government's planting for food and jobs program. Managing director of the company, Francis Agwon Lahore, made this known when an executive delegation of the company paid a ketsi call on President Ekufuado at the Flagstaff House. And those who were shots from the Flagstaff House want to move on tonight. And a former Deputy Minister of Finance, Kweku Rikis Hagen, says he fully supports the nomination of three Deputy Finance Ministers, describing it as crucial because of the current developments in the economy. Government has been heavily criticized following the nomination of three Deputy Ministers for the various ministries, including uh, uh, a to making it a total of uh, 110 ministers, the highest in history. Mr. Rickett Hagen tells Joy Business the kind of work at the ministry needs more than two deputies. At the moment, the old structure is that you have two deputies. One deputy is responsible for finance. Then you have the other deputy who is responsible for economic strategy. With the financial services, you need someone who is really dedicated to looking at basically helping shape up our financial intermediaries in the system, but the euro bond and the type of other bonds that we are beginning to expose ourselves to in the market, you need that kind of a financial economics political lead. The Ministry of Finance is at the center of the whole economy. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in the last four years is actually to try and anchor all the ministries to the Ministry of Finance, especially to do with how projects and other things are planned. And so the workload there can be extremely heavy if the work is to be done properly. Additional person may not be needed, but additional person can be helped. Well, government is insisting the removal of some taxes and reviewing other levies will reduce petroleum prices and cost of doing business. Government yesterday secured Parliament's approval to amend portions of the country's tax laws to give meaning to propose tax cuts announced in the 2017 budget. President Kufuado is expected to give his assent soon before it can be implemented possibly from next week. But the minority in parliament has questioned the relevance of these tax cuts, insisting it will have little impact on the cost of living. But Deputy uh, Finance Minister designate Kweku Kwarten disagrees. The last five years, it is because the strategy of taxation and taxation has failed and businesses and those who would bring in the revenue have not been performing. The way to correct a situation like that is to provide relief for businesses, those who bring the revenue, to provide relief so that the revenue they bring would deal with the fiscal difficulties you are faced with. What that should tell anybody clearly is that the strategies have been wrong. These tax reliefs are intended to reverse this trend. We should see some significant reduction. Don't forget that special... How much? How much? It is difficult to say because we are operating a deregulated pricing regime and individuals that sell these products have the liberty to sell it at the price they choose. What these interventions are seeking to achieve is to reduce government's contribution to the price builder. So the special trillium tax that has been reduced from 17.5% to 15 will bring some relief. The excise duty that has been abolished will bring some relief. Moving on, the IMF country representative Dr. Natalia Kuliodina says any extension of Ghana's program with the fund will depend solely on government. There are reports the country's program with the fund will be extended to December 2018 because it may not be able to meet all the targets by April next year. But Dr. Kuledina says the fund is not in the position to push for an extension. Well, the program ends uh, in April 2018. And uh, are we looking at the targets that we are supposed to, or what we are supposed to achieve? Are we likely to meet all these targets and benchmark by April 2018? Well, with respect to all the performance criteria and structural benchmarks and uh, their implementation uh, last year, the review mission will, uh, will be assessing those. With respect to the fiscal target, well, uh, as I said, uh, obviously the fiscal slippage is an important step back. 
And therefore, even though that this year fiscal consolidation envisaged in the budget is quite significant, it would not take uh, the fiscal sector all the way down as was envisaged in the program, and it is natural that a little bit more time would be required to achieve the program objectives. Does it give credence for the possible extension of the program to December 2018? Well, it is up to the authorities to decide whether they would like to have an extension. That is on the government's part? Yes. Oh. Yeah, the government needs to ask the fund uh, if it would like to have an extension of the program. And it is possible if uh, an extension is asked in order to uh, achieve program. We want to go back now to our earlier story about the ministerial appointees and numbers and the controversy arising from that. And what we're hearing is that the state is expected to set aside 1.5 million cities as total monthly benefits for ministers under this administration. And that's the conclusion we may draw, George, uh, after going through documents covering the salaries of uh, public officials. Mm -hmm. How did we come to this conclusion? Well, Daryl, it's not just also about the document, but those who, are, who worked on salaries covering these public officials, some consultants, and even members of the Presidential Emolumentary Committee. So let's do some scenarios. When you go through the report, you see that the highest person on that report in terms of salary or total benefit in terms of the allowances and all those things might be taking home about 16,000 Ghana cities, or a little over 16,000. Uh, Ghana cities every month. Hmm. The lowest person being a deputy minister, minister for the region could be taking about 11,000. Now, if you do the calculations and even work with the average of 14,000, we're looking at somewhere around the, the 1.5 uh, million that is every month. If you stretch it or extrapolate it to a year, you're looking at uh, a little around 18,000. Now, Daryl, let's stretch this thing to even 20,000 for each of these ministers. If all of them are moving away from their parliamentary uh, benefits that they'll get to mm. this executive. And even you move it to 20,000, you're looking at somewhere around a little over 20 million Ghana cities. Now, let's look at the next question might be whether the budget, the can, budget can accommodate now, this expenditure. If you go through the budget, government is setting aside about 16 billion Ghana cities as total compensation for public sector workers. Now, if you look at, do the calculation for these 110 ministers, that should be just around a little over 20 million Ghana cities. Mm. So that is just a, a fraction uh, of what we might set aside when it comes to total public expenditure. But the concern is that are we going to expand the economy? Are we going to generate more revenue so that this will be insignificant? Or the economy cannot expand? And therefore, there have been times when we got the understanding that the government had to borrow to pay public sector workers. So that has been the concern of a lot of people whether these ministers indeed can deliver. And don't forget, when they come on board too, you're looking at their vehicles, you're looking at other related benefits, their personal assistants, their drivers, and all those things, and that could still push the bill up. But the argument is whether the economy would be able to expand. We are worth almost about 160 billion Ghana cities, but this is just about a percentage point of it. Mm. But if we expand and we, we grow, we generate more revenue, then... Some might say, and I will emphasize on that, that as much I do about nothing. All right. Thanks for the analysis. George Afe joining me with some analysis on the controversy about the large number of ministerial appointees. We want to move on now because a uh, leading food manufacturing company, Pumasido Ghana, has embarked on a mission to become the first Ghanaian company to register its identity in the Guinness Book of World Records. The company says Onga, a seasoning powder brand will attempt to break the world record for the longest feast table. That sounds very interesting. And Amele Josu has more in this report. The longest feast table event will showcase Ghana's food culture to the world on the 25th of March 2017 at Independence Square with an expected crowd of over 3,000 people. As part of the company's corporate social responsibility, six selected orphanages will also receive donations as part of measures to help alleviate their challenges after the event. Brand manager of Onga, Emil Tego, throws more light on this. It's going to be a strictly by invitation event. When you get there, you'd have um, some souvenirs. 
we would, once we've settled, we have the officials measuring the table so that it's certified and let us know that, yes, we've really achieved the 1,900 meters that we are planning. And then post the record announcement, we'll have a celebration. The plan is to grow bigger and better. Um, there's more market out there for us. And we are not going to relent on our oils. We are going to go all out. She also appealed to government to address the issue of under-invoicing that has plagued the economy. And competition is stiff. You have um, people bringing in products that possibly they evaded taxes, they're undercutting. And here you are employing people, paying your taxes, pay, paying employees, and then it's, it's a bit difficult. Our politicians should walk their talk. All the um, leakages that they intend to plug, they should. I mean, if the people are bringing it, they should really tax them and then make everybody contribute their worth to the building of the nation. Saudi Arabia's markets leader in the edible oil sector, Afia International Company, currently holds the record for the longest feast table, which is 1,508 meters long, and Onga plans to beat this with a length of 1,900 meters. Now, Member of Parliament for Clotet Quali constituency, Zenato Rolling, has highlighted the need for financial literacy programs for market women to be able to withstand the difficult economic times. She spoke with Joy Business at the CMB market during a tour of some markets in the central business district of Accra. The current economic hardship has also taken a toll on market women. For instance, recent increases in prices of petroleum products have led to an increase in the cost of doing business. It is against this background that the parliamentary member for the Corley Clotte constituency embarked on a tour to assess the real impact of the upward adjustment of fuel prices on the market women. Madame Zenato Rollins later shared her thoughts in an interview with Joy Business. You know, the uh, fuel prices have gone up and it's just to see what the impact on, um, you know, the traders in the markets as well. Because as you know, when fuel prices go up, the fare groups up for transport, and then there's a knock-on effect on food prices as well. And just to see what's happening as well. So far, what have you observed? There's still a lot of activity going on, but a lot of people are complaining that things have gotten a bit difficult. So it's just to assess, you know, what's going on and what we can do to to support their efforts here. The MP also explained the situation can be salvaged through adequate financial literacy programs designed for the market women. So what we can only do is to see how we can help people to manage their finances, you know, those who are looking for support in terms of you know, advice on how to manage with their finances as the situation is, because the reality is, you know, the women who are selling at the market cannot control the price of fuel, cannot control the price of uh, transportation fares. So then the question becomes, what can we do to support the little group, the cooperatives, so that they can manage better on their own? Shiletta McClure reporting for Joy Business. In other business news tonight, the General Agri Workers Association or Union says government will not be able to meet its revenue targets if it fails to pay maximum attention on the agri sector. Now, assessing the 2017 budget read to Parliament by the Finance Minister Ken Ophiata Gao reveals government's policies to boost the agri sector is not satisfying enough. Here's more in this report. The 69th National Executive Council meeting of Gao brought together some agri workers and executives of the union. They expressed, among others, some key concerns facing the sector. General Secretary of Gao, Edward Karawa, says government planning for food and jobs policy could be achieved in the next three years if only it provides ready market for food crops produced. Production is one stage of a whole process. And we are told that production is incomplete until the final consumer. We want to ask government to ensure that adequate policies are made to provide markets for the produce that we are intending to have within the next three, four months' time through this illustrious policy. Most of us seated here and outside this place have gone into farming before. 
Many people have run out of farming, not because they were unable to produce, but they produced and there was no market. The youth that we are encouraging to go into farming, into agriculture, we don't want the same fate to befall them. So we want government to ensure that there's adequate market for the production that is intended. Speaking to Joy Business, President of Gao, Edward Oku Ambofo, emphasized government's agri sector has the potential of creating more jobs and ending the menace of unemployment. Well, agri is the backbone of the country. Uh, we know the rural cocoa is praying. Anytime cocoa money comes in, it even challenges the dollar. So for Gao, we have a role to play and we are equal stakeholders in the country's development agencies. For instance, if we talk about the challenges ahead in terms of food security in the country and worldwide. Right now we are speaking, we know the challenges that some of the regions in the Sahel are facing with regard to drought and food. So that's the reason why GAO is poised to make sure that the new administration, incoming administration, like the new government, which is preparing for, let's say, a policy of one village wind down, GAO is going to be a strategic stakeholder in those policies to make sure that vision become a fruition. The 69th neck meeting of Gao held at the Bones Cooker College in the Eastern Region saw executives come up with a four-year action plan on the best ways to engage government and the private sector in expanding the agri sector. You're watching Business Live. We have more business news at the other side of this break. Welcome back to Business Live. More now on the controversy surrounding the large number of ministerial appointees and talk about the potential impact on the economy. Joining us now is financial consultant Daniel Amate Anim. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight on Business Live. I'm sure you've been following the discussions all over. Uh, do we have any cause for alarm? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Yes, looking at the numbers, uh, maybe the, the initial cost of running government machinery, of course, uh, will increase. But I'm looking at a bigger picture uh, where maybe government wanted to fast track its policies. Uh, that is ensuring that uh, we develop this country, we grow the economy to a level where we could create jobs and opportunities for the citizens of the country. So. With where I see it, I can see that kind of strategy that government wanted to implement. That's the reason which you will see that for every specific uh, goal and then policy that government wanted to implement, you can see a, mini, a ministerial portfolio being created to take care of that. Uh, so in a long future, in a, in within, with, by, the, by, the, by the end of government tenure, one would have expected, or even after the two years, one would have expected that Whatever strategy the government wanted to implement by creating more portfolio, ministerial portfolio, will yield the necessary dividend. However, uh, it is equally uh, expedient to actually look at other aspects of, of the, of the numbers. Uh, you, you could see clearly that some of the, uh, the ministry, their responsibility will overlap going forward. What I would advise is that when they get to a point where there's an overlapping responsibility, uh, the, the respective minister should be able to uh, understand that they are working together to achieve a common goal. For instance, if you look at the Ministry of Trade and Business Development, there's a likelihood of uh, uh, roles and responsibility emerging at a particular point in time. And when they get to that point, they should be able to put their uh, egos aside and work as a team to achieve that particular concern. However, there are certain ministries that, personally, I believe that if we emerge them, it will have been better. Uh, for instance, the uh, road, transport, railway, and adaptation. Uh, maybe we haven't uh, road and railway combined will be appropriate. Maybe aviation and then transport coming together will be better. But however, as I said, it is with where I see it, it is clear that the mm. government wanted to pursue a particular agenda in ensuring that uh, yeah. we achieve a specific kind of uh, target in particular 
outlet of the economy, hence the need to create portfolio. All right. Uh, I, I, I want to come in here because you do not have so much time. Um, all right. I, I'm just wondering, are there any cost-cutting measures government can explore? Because we're hearing now that it may have to set aside 1.5 million cities as total monthly benefits for these ministers. So how do you make up, how do you cut costs to make up for um, the expenses? Yes, of course. Uh, that's what I said. Uh, I initially, it may, in a way, distort government revenue. But if the overall objective is to ensure maximization of economic resources and the development of the country, then to me, it is good. So within the interest, really struggling government might have done their, their, their uh, cost-benefit analysis and probably looked at their revenue portfolio and taken into consideration the 1.5 million that you've mentioned that, okay, within this period, they will be able to take care of it. Then, of course. I think it is to order way, but the, what I wanted us to look at is the bigger picture. We, the debate shouldn't be focused only on the cost. Should it only be the cost? Let's ask the question. If yes, the cost, we have the money for it, let's also assume that we have the money for it. But we should be looking at it that with this moment, what is going to be the impact on the national economy with respect to economic growth and development? If we can have these two mention that I think we'll be having a very meaningful discussion rather than focusing or narrowing on the course we may deny ourselves the opportunity to be able to execute uh, or to fast track certain policies that maybe government may deem it necessary and very important okay so these uh, appointments could in yours to the benefit of the country your perspective thanks very much indeed that was a financial consultant uh, Daniel Amate and him you're still watching Business Live, we want to move on now to the business agenda. And my colleague Kuku Aban brings us today's edition of the business agenda. It's here once again, and you're welcome to the business agenda. It is powered by Joy Business in association with myjoyonline.com forward slash business. And today's is a renewed call for government to scrap the 5% fiscal stabilization levy introduced in July 2013. The levy imposed on businesses in key sectors of the economy was to last for just 18 months, ending January 2015, but is yet to be removed. And the chief executive of MTN Ghana, that's the largest telecom company in the country, Ebenezer Asante, wants government to take a second look at the levy and, and remove it in the spirit of transforming the economy from one of taxation to production. And for how long um, is the country going to be on a stabilization mode? For which reason some of us will have to pay over and above the mandatory taxes and levies. So that is why we continue to appeal to government um, for the past two years that that should be considered. And we are not saying this alone. All the banks and other related agencies who are also paying these fees are asking for it to be waived. If there is any nuisance tax in our industry, for me, it is the biggest one the National Stabilization Levy. So that was Chief Executive of Ghana's leading telecoms company, MTN Ghana, Ebenezer Asante. So what have industry watchers got to say about this? Now, tax consultant Ali Nachian agrees the fiscal stabilization levy should be scrapped as soon as possible. For him, government should have even added it to the pack of taxes that were recently scrapped in the 2017 budget. Let's listen to him. I, I agree that it should be scrapped because the reason why the business community finds it a nuisance that is obvious. It is a, a levy that is collected on your profit before tax. And this is on your projected income because it's paid, it's paid up for. And it's not a cost. You can't deduct it from your income from business. And it is not a tax in payment of your advanced tax liability. It's just a levy that goes to assist government in, in raising funds to rebuild the economy. It's an idea that has operated in some countries over the years, but it's normally done for a period, maybe two years, three years, so that government will get excess revenue to put the nation back in state so businesses can try. But it has tended to be a perpetual uh, tax, and, and it's a bit worrying because 
It distorts the cash flow of, of businesses. It locks them up because it's paid up front and it's quarterly. You know, and I think that is one of the taxes that should have been considered first and foremost to have been removed. Tax consultant Ali Nachian there. You might want to join us again next week for another dose of the business agenda powered by Joy Business in association with myjoyonline.com forward slash business. All right, this is uh, Business Live. We want to move on now, I believe, to our interview of the day. And, uh, well, Ecobank has maintained that it will be focusing more on electronic channels as a good strategy in terms of attracting more deposits. Its uh, managing director, Dan Saki, has been speaking to Joy Business. This is the direction we intend to go. And basically, we are responding to the needs of our customers. We are responding to the changing lifestyles of the average Ghanaian. We realize that our phones have basically become part of our lives. Okay. Whilst we all seek a, a product or a service that is simple to receive or to deliver, what we have done with our mobile app is to allow our clients from the convenience of their homes, of their offices, other places that they frequent, to be able to have access to their account and make the payment. We believe that if we push along this line, we will be able to reduce the level of cash handling in the country. In doing so, we are also responding to a need of most of our clients and even the growing Ghanaian populace who really do not want to walk into a bank before they undertake simple, ordinary payment transactions that have become part of our daily lives. So just as you make your call in the morning, you would want to pay for your breakfast in the morning. We believe that our job as your bank is to facilitate that payment without you coming into the bank. If you want to pay for your newspaper, we believe that we should facilitate that. If you want to pay for your lunch or you want to pay for a nice shirt, we believe that our job is to facilitate that. So you are increasingly going to see EcoBank directing more of our attention and investment efforts into the digital space. And this is to respond directly to the emerging need. Would that influence on your branch opinion and the fiscal evidence as well, if you're going to have you on electronic because the, the spread is, is bigger than some of you estimated? The branches are there to serve client needs. And if those client needs, or the majority of them, are transitioning into other channels, largely the electronic channels, we believe that we need to tailor our strategy and move towards the electronic channel. You can always keep up to date on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Join us tomorrow for another edition of Business Live. My name is Daryl Kyle. Stay tuned.